to the MYS Virtual Hangout. Here's your host, MYS Music Director, Raul Gomez. Good afternoon and welcome to another MYS Virtual Hangout. You guys, this is Hangout 42. We've done 42 of these. And I am so excited to welcome the Breaking Winds Bassoon Quartet to the virtual hangout. Now, if you were watching during our uh, standby screen, you were listening to this just amazing album. It's actually three. Stravinsky, The Three Great Ballets, Ralph Spring, Petrushka and Firebird by the London Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by Bernard Haitink, right here in our MYS record player okay uh this lp is from 1974 and uh it was given to me by an uncle of mine in costa rica who had now i have it this incredible collection of old classical music lps so that's what we're listening to just a little stravinsky to get things started and while we continue to listen to that in the background um i thought I would tell you just a little bit about the Breaking Winds and instead of telling you too much about them I want to play about a minute of a YouTube video of them sort of uh, their first big hit so to speak uh, and then we'll get to talk with 75% uh, of the Breaking Winds uh, three of the four members of the quartet are standing by right now so I met one of the members of the Breaking Winds, Carl Amore, uh, through the Orchestra of the Americas. We were on tour. I don't even remember which tour. I'll ask her, because maybe she'll remember. Uh, but we met uh, on tour, and then through her, I got to know the Breaking Winds. And eventually, when I lived in New Orleans, an organization I was involved with brought them to New Orleans, so we got to experience them live. So a bassoon quartet, right? Well, this is really a lot more than just a bassoon quartet. And like I said, let me start with showing you guys about a minute of a video of the Breaking Winds, and then we will welcome them into the Hangout. Enjoy. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Lady Gaga! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so you get a taste of the breaking winds if you were not familiar with them. And now, please join me in welcoming the breaking winds into the MYS virtual hangout. And there you guys are. How's it going? <laughs> hey! It's great to see you. Thank you for taking the time to do this. And look, why don't we start with uh, each of you introducing yourselves, if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, starting in my sort of the order that you appear here, Kara, then Yuki, and then Lauren. Yeah, hey, Raul, hey. Um, so my name is Kara. I'm in, obviously a bassoonist. We're all bassoonists now in this chat. Welcome to our weird world. Um, <laughs> The, the Breaking Winds is actually about 10, 11 years old as a project now. So what you just witnessed was kind of uh, right from the very beginning, what we were all about. It's really exciting to see you, Raul. Yeah, and it's great everyone. to see you. Thank you. So Yuki, let's hear from you. I'm Yuki. I currently live in New York City. Um, and yeah. So what what are you up to these days? What's uh, what's happening in New York? Um, still you know self quarantining, self isolating, and um, I have a day job working in tech support. So I just got off work now. <laughs> so my brain is a little mushy right now. Okay, you know? <laughs> it's perfect for trivia. Yeah. Mushy brain is good yeah. for trivia, yeah. actually. That's gonna, that's gonna get my brain back on track. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Lauren. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren. Uh, I currently live in Washington, D.C. And uh, in addition to being a bassoonist, um, well, I am a math tutor, uh, but I also just finished a software engineering boot camp. So I'm entering the tech field as well. Wow. Um, and I am terrible at trivia. So this is going to be embarrassing having to give my answers. But you're great at bassoon. <laughs> so. Well, you know, I guess I guess things balance out. And but. this is bassoon <laughs> trivia, so well, I, I, you know, I, I'm. Are you guys competitive? Oh, Who's... Kara, very, <laughs> and she's always the best too. So, <laughs> so good at trivia. It's true. <laughs> so, of all four of you, Kara is the most competitive one. You would say. I think so. Not not meant in. Uh, not as a criticism, just as, <laughs> yes, you know, maybe Brittany trivia anyway. So, so hey, yeah, you know what, Let, let's, let's do this. So you guys have known each other for a long time. You uh, went to Eastman, you were all in the same bassoon studio. And then you, of course you played together a lot in person when you were in Rochester, then you all moved to different cities and you still, you know, find ways to, you know, collaborate and be active as a quartet. Um, but you're friends and you've known each other for a long time. So we have three out of four. But what I would love to do, and uh, like, I didn't tell you this in advance, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious. So I would like for each of you to describe the other three members of the quartet with just one word, okay? Mm -hmm. a, a, you know, an adjective or, a, you know, or whatever you want. So why don't we start with Lauren? You look so... Uh, you're deep in thought, so I don't want to let you think too much. So just one word for each of the members of the quartet. Hey, well, this isn't quite an adjective, but I would call Kara the Rembrandt of our group. Oh. Um, <laughs> this is very hard. Yeah, don't, don't think too much. It could be a collar, it could uh, be a food. Uh, Pikachu for Yuki. And Brittany will go with mm, mountain climber. Okay, Kara, let's let's uh, let's have you go next. Well, I know I was just thinking of an analogy that probably no one even understands in 2020. <laughs> I was thinking of the Ninja Turtles, <laughs> uh, in which case I would say that Brittany, our missing member, is probably uh, Donatello. And Lauren, I would say, is Michelangelo. And Yuki is Raphael. Okay, and that leaves you... <laughs> I, I lost track. Th that makes you what? Leonardo. Um, Leonardo, okay. <laughs> Yuki, how about you? Um, so for Kara, I would say she is the word creative. Um, 
and then Brittany would be like the communicator and then Lauren would be the quirky one. <laughs> Very good. Very These good. are adjectives that describe kind of like in my mind how we work well like those are our um <laughs> I don't want I guess like our uh strengths in the quartet that we bring um our talents yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean those are actual thoughtful responses <laughs> Yuki's the thoughtful one <laughs> there you go but I mean it does sound like you guys complement each other I mean and really if you didn't you wouldn't have lasted 10 or 11 years and still be looking ahead to to new things so let's go back to the beginnings of of the uh, of this project so first of all a bassoon quartet there aren't that many prof i mean do you how many professional bassoon quartets do you guys know mm -hmm. maybe two or three we actually were inspired by a bassoon quartet that was active that would play a recital every single year in the late 60s and early 70s in Boston. And they were called the Bubonic Bassoon Quartet. <laughs> and <laughs> so, yeah, they set up this tradition of bassoon quartets being like a comedy troupe and they did spoofs on classical music. And honestly, we took some of those ideas and ran with them. The cool thing about them was that they had the forethought to, to um, put all their concerts on tape and to release albums and all this and and that's why we were able to experience their work um and actually just last summer we did a retrospective of their work with one of the original members Whoa, who cool. ultimately he enjoyed a long career as principal bassoonist of the minnesota orchestra john miller was his name um but yeah i mean then there's also the tradition of, of them like doing recordings and stuff which is how we ended up on youtube kind of in the early days of youtube sure um, but there are a couple other groups that, like, are quartets made up of serious or professional bassoonists. Um, it's definitely not, like, a career track in the way that you could apply to, like, 30 different symphony orchestras. Sure, sure. Um, you just make your quartet and you perform uh, if you're enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. And Lauren, were, so you guys were all at Eastman. Did, did you all graduate? It's like same year or what, what like where you can stagger in your time yes yeah, so the very original iteration of us included um Hera, myself and Brittany, and um a former classmate darren and then uh so we were all in the same class ah. and yuki was the year below us uh and then the three of us stayed in rochester and uh darren moved on so at that time we weren't really um serious yet so it, we did, it didn't make sense to do long distance. Um, and then so Yuki joined and we consider her a founding member as well because she was involved from the start with our um, videos and yeah. setting up, helping with recitals. So. But in reality, even though, you know, a few of you were one year apart, like you're all part of the same studio, right? Oh, yes. yes. So you all have like studio class together and you're playing and, you know, with the Eastman Orchestra together and just so you guys by default we're already spending a lot of time together yes right? definitely yeah the only advantage yuki has is she turns uh well she turned 30 after all of us and she'll turn 40 after all of us so she gets <laughs> the baby. She's a baby yeah she's a baby uh and yuki what 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 came first the uh the uh group and the idea or the name of the group Oh gosh, I would imagine it was the idea of the group first, but I was not the one involved in the naming of the group. Um, but there is a story where, you know, we, before I was there, you know, we, they were called the Breaking Weeks Bassoon Quartet. And then there's a Christmas um, concert that people can play in, in the, um, like the main hall of, the Eastman like main building um and I think the story is that you know the, the dean or somebody wasn't too keen on the name Breaking Winds and uh wanted us to change it um and I don't know what name was used but the bassoon buffoons, the bassoon buffoons um, oh 
But then after we... But wait, wait, sorry. But, but that was for like yeah. an official Eastman function? It was for an Eastman function. I yeah. see, and okay. He was invited and things. Um, but then this, I believe the second year, um, and I can't remember if I was in the quartet or not by then, um, but when, when we put out um, our like first, or no, our second iteration of YouTube videos that started blowing up and it became uh, really popular and viral within that community, yeah. then, you know, the name stuck and you know, <laughs> the breaking with. The, rest, know, the, the rest is history. <laughs> um, so the, the bassoon buffoons were, were other names also uh, considered Lauren early on, do you remember? Um, well, Kara was the one that actually came up with the Breaking Winds, and yeah, the Bassoon Buffoons were not, that was nothing that we were seriously considering um, for our group long term. It was only to, uh, <laughs> yeah. just with our alias, but yeah, we were never seriously considering anything else, I don't think. Uh, I, oh, at some point we considered the bulk of majority, but that, that name was already taken for a Bassoon camp, so. The what majority? The vocal majority. Oh. I think there's still the vocal majority. So we were, that was an idea. But um, yeah, that's actually a Basuda and Noble fan. So. Kara, was the Lady Gaga um, medley you, your first thing you did together? Or, or did you do other things? Like, I guess, like original or, you know. Right. Yeah, I mean, Yuki mentioned that there is that holiday sing event at the Eastman School, and that was like the first first thing that we did. Um, that along with learning the music from the bubonic bassoon quartet. Right, sure, sure. But when we were trying to like figure out what is this quartet and like what is our project, I think Lady Gaga Saga probably was basically the first one, and definitely our first attempt at doing like our own arrangement of something and combining it with something more theatrical yeah. um so yeah the costumes the choreography that whole thing were you guys expecting that that particular video would become so popular and, and so widely shared i remember oh go ahead head lauren oh um i remember when we first put it up we were hoping like come on a thousand views come on a thousand and i think it was Overnight, it was like 10,000 views. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> or if it wasn't one night, it was within a couple of days, it was 10,000. So that was pretty cool. And I guess, I mean, that must have been a moment of like you guys going like, hey, we, we might be up to something here. So yes. what what happened then? Like what 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 steps did you guys take as a group after that? Yeah, I remember because I feel like a historian sometimes talking about this. You have to understand this was the early days of YouTube. And <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe the word viral was a thing, but it might not have been. Actually, I don't think it was. Um, so just like the idea that like my sister had a friend in South Carolina who like called her and asked, did I just see your sister? shared on Facebook for some reason. And it was, it was just all this whole brave new world people didn't understand yet. So yeah, to a certain extent we were like, oh, now we have an audience and we need branding and we need more content and all this. Like we were aware of this, but there wasn't really as much of a system and a pipeline of how you do that. People weren't really talking about content creation. Um, so we had this beautiful opportunity to make it up as we went along, which is perfect because that's exactly our style. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have hundreds of thousands of views on your uh, videos. <laughs> that's really awesome. Yeah, we were really disappointed the first weekend we released Lady Gaga when we were finally supplanted. We were actually the number one music video on YouTube nice. over the weekend. <laughs> uh, and then finally we got beat out by Miley Cyrus. Ah! Miley. Well, you didn't do a Miley Cyrus medley next. Oh. You would have dethroned Miley with her own music. So. Talked about Green Wrecking Ball, but never came to fruition. 
<laughs> How about the the visual choreography aspect of it? Like, did you guys come up with that together? Or was it how? What was the process like? Do you have a choreographer? Sarah is our choreographer. <laughs> I used to be. Now we're like really good at um, exploring this style. But I grew up in Texas. Brittany did too. So we had a big marching band background that Yuki and Lauren didn't as much. Right, and and my right. marching band uh, instrument was the flag. I was on the color guard and <laughs> was used to learning choreography and dancing all over the place. And, um, and so I was really excited to try some marching band moves on the bassoon, basically. Yeah. Um, but it was a process because at first, we weren't even comfortable standing to perform. It's still not 100% commonly accepted for bassoonists to, to even like play a recital standing. Mm -hmm. So it was like baby steps, like, okay, let's stand. Okay, now let's try like bending over. Did that work? Okay. <laughs> we didn't impale ourselves. <laughs> we, we froze for a moment there, but so so you tried all these things and you basically started to build a uh, i guess you could call it like a physical like repertoire of things that you can do as a group um how so i, I, I take it at the beginning at least Kara, were you making the arrangements for the group or, or was that also I had done the Lady Gaga one since that was like something I wanted to experiment with. Um, but something special in our group is that we all arrange, mm. all four of us. And the way we pick repertoire is kind of just by our interest and in who wants to make the arrangement. Yeah. Who made the uh, Jurassic Shelter arrangement? That was Lauren. That was Lauren? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, this is a uh, you guys shared three videos with us and the first one was of course the lady gaga video and i would love to show the jurassic shelter video next so lauren will you will you talk about this arrangement and also the project because it's it's so cool what this is so will, will you share about that and then we'll we'll watch the video sure so i always loved the jurassic theme um, it's just really beautiful. And I think this was around when the newer dress movies were starting to pop up. So it seemed like it made sense for us to do something like that. Um, and in actual, like the arranging of it, it what's really cool is it, um, I felt like we could really exploit the range of the bassoon to get the really lows and the really highs and make different voices pop. So that's what I tried to do in this arrangement. And, and Kara actually made the connection with uh, the, the project, the video project uh, um, in her, around her home in Missouri at that time. Very cool. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and listen to that. This is about three and a half minutes long. So we'll listen to the whole thing and we'll talk more about that and about your work as a quartet for music education. Does that sound like a plan? And uh, also, uh, uh, Paya, the, the MOI student, is asking if we're going to have a uh, two truths and a lie segment, which is something we <laughs> do uh, for the hangouts. But Paya, instead of that, we're going to play bassoon trivia with the breaking winds. We'll do that a little later, and you guys watching can also play along. Okay? For the time being, let's enjoy Jurassic Animal Shelter by the Breaking Winds. <laughs>
ducks in the uh, uh, dinosaur uh, costumes, and then they're like playing like between your legs. And like... <laughs> um, do you guys play a lot by memory, Yuki? Do you guys do a lot of playing by memory? We we don't generally play by memory, um, mostly because we just have a thick folder of everything. Um, that we've ever arranged, some things that we've never even actually played um, in a concert before. <laughs> and just kind of depending on the gig, um, maybe some recommendations or the type of group, um, or even just on the spot, like if we're playing with younger students and they just might not be um, paying as much attention and then we were like you know what let's not play this and then let's just switch to a different piece sure, sure. Uh, that maybe we didn't even rehearse <laughs> um and then just jump into that um to try to keep that momentum going um we played by memory a few shows um to really like help with the i guess just like the visual aspect of um the concert um but but yeah we generally play with you know, music stands and... Yeah, but for something like this video, it makes a lot of sense yeah. to do it by memory. You don't want the music stands like in front of you. And, uh, right. but, mm -hmm. but so you were talking about playing for young audiences. So is that something that you guys seek to do as a way to, you know, do outreach when you get together? Yeah, definitely. Um, we... I remember in the beginning, like we might get one email from a band director from a small little town um, and they're interested in bringing us over and um, to just kind of like work with the budget. And, you know, since we're there, we might as well create like a week long tour. So we would send out like hundreds of emails to different <laughs> uh, school districts and band directors um, venues to see who might bite. Um, lately though, we we're, we'll, we mostly get um, inquiries um, a lot of times from universities or from uh, community bands or orchestras or from um, things like, um, like we recently did a fundraiser in Montana and did a double read day in Arizona. So people will um, inquire and bring us in um, yeah when's the last time you were all together in person february which for a lot of touring performing groups that's like as recent as it gets right right it's such a shame we we just a couple weeks ago were supposed to be performing together in iowa city um, every time a date like that passes on the calendar, yeah. it's, it's kind of a sad moment, yeah. but it's really great that we were together in February. We did a week long stint in Billings, Montana, where we did go into schools of all levels from elementary to high school. And we actually had some students from the local university come by too, which is always really awesome for us to interact with students like that. Um, so yeah, actually music education was the most recent sort of activity we were doing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean you you you're you're all busy and you're in different cities. So I mean just just the planning and the logistics of, of getting together is a huge burden. Uh, but you know you guys are great at what you do and you clearly love doing it and that that keeps you going. Um, you guys, I think it's time to play a bassoon trivia. Are you are, are you ready for this? All right, yeah, we brought our A games. Did you? Okay, did, did you stay up? I hope you didn't stay up all night studying for these. I pulled out my textbook. Yeah, because I mean, it's no small thing, but but you know the the only the prize, the first first place winner, really only gets bragging rights. But that's that's something, right? It, it's it it's goes significant. Along with we'll we'll put it on a press kit. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, before we start, I do want to thank Chris Wedemore. He's the uh, Metropolitan, Youth, uh, Metropolitan Youth 
Symphony Artistic Operations Manager and a co-producer of the Hangout. Chris is a trivia master and he put together uh. this trivia that we're about to play. So if you guys are watching, please feel free to play along. You can, you can uh, guess in the comments, okay? And you can also keep track of your points. Now I'm gonna be keep, keeping track of the Breaking Winds points, okay? We have three rounds of trivia, okay? First round, three questions or all are multiple choice you get one point per each correct answer okay and you guys have your little piece of paper with the letters that you're gonna show to your webcam at the count of three and i will count so okay. round one is three questions one point each round two is two questions and each correct answer gets you three points and then third and final round one question five points uh, wow. okay so anything is possible anything is possible uh, so let's get started I um, have everything ready to go here and I'm gonna move us over to the trivia screen okay, here we are and now me? let me add... remember, I'm really bad at trivia yeah I think it, <laughs> well, we'll see we'll, we'll let the points do the talking okay I think I think you you <laughs> I think that is just fine. Okay, so you guys ready? Here's question number one. Okay, and I guess you can re you can really see them, so I'll just try to uh, be very uh, clear here. Okay, question number one is: What is the total length of a bassoon? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Lauren! <laughs> okay, we have three C's and you are all correct. Woo! So everybody gets a point. So what I do now, I'm gonna, I have a, a here, a thing on the screen with your points. So you get a one, you get a one, and you get a one. Okay, very good. And uh, for reference, I have a little, uh, uh, bits here thanks to Chris for reference the total length of a French horn is about 12 feet a tuba is about 18 feet and the human small intestine is about 22 feet <laughs> so there you have it very good so we're tied at one point each okay here is question two okay oh what did this change all right I'm gonna have to uh, do a little something here though, okay? Okay, here we go. Question two is, from what type of wood are most bassoons made? A, mm. walnut, B, maple, C, bamboo, D, plywood. <laughs> okay, so get your answers ready. You know, my wallet would really appreciate some of these answers <laughs> well, hey, more maybe, than the true answer. <laughs> maybe there's a business idea there for you. Yeah. Right? Next generation of weatherproof yeah. bassoons. Okay, you guys ready? Give me a thumbs up. Long, okay? So uh, let's move on to question three. Still playing for one point per correct answer. Okay. Question three is, which opening from a famous early 20th century piece of classical music can be sung to the lyrics, I am not an English horn? Here are your options. Option A, Beethoven Symphony No. 5. Option B, The Ride of Spring by Stravinsky. Option C, Berio's Sequenza. Option D, Vivaldi's The Four Seasons. So, the lyrics are, I am not an English horn. Oh, uh, wait a moment, what's happening? Uh, oh, I see. Maybe we got, um, we dropped the connection here or something. 
Uh, so Pai and Naomi say they couldn't hear or see, but everything seems to be working fine. So let me guys know if, if you can see now. They missed question two. So I'll just go back and do a quick recap. Maybe something happened. Uh, the answer for question two is B, maple. Okay. Oh, it cut off. Okay. So uh, they were all right. All three members of the Breaking Winds were correct. So the answer was B, maple. So we're tied at two points each. All right. So here's question three. I'll say it again. Which opening from a famous early 20th century piece of classical music can be sung to the lyrics, I am not an English horn? Okay. You guys ready with your answers? Oh, yeah. Let's see them. One, two, three. And they all got it right. It's B, the Rite of Spring. Who wants to demonstrate with your voice? Take it away, Yuki. <clears throat> oh, gosh. <clears throat> I am not an English word. <laughs> Very good. That's exactly right. You're, that's, that's ready for the recording studio. And, um, oh, I forgot to share the, uh, the uh, interesting fact about the previous question about what type of wood. So I'll read that first. It says here, less expensive models are also made of materials such as polypropylene and ebonite, primarily for student and outdoor use. Metal bassoons were made in the past, but have not been produced by any major manufacturer since 1889. That's a hmm. bit of trivia about what bassoons are made of. And uh, about this one, Stravinsky's uh, solo at the beginning of Rite of Spring, the opening bassoon solo was taken from a Lithuanian folk song titled Tu Manu Seserele. Of the opening, Stravinsky wrote, My idea was that the prelude should represent the awakening of nature, the scratching, gnawing, wiggling of birds and beasts. Have you guys played mm. this in concert? Any of you? You have? Yes, you should have heard the scratching, wiggling sound that I made. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a fabulous piece. It's super fun to play. It's so fun. How, yeah. Lauren, you, you nodded emphatically. How, how, how is playing that solo? I mean, it's, it's such, it's so famous. It's the opening of this major, like, history-changing piece of music. It's pretty nerve-wracking. Um, another bassoonist that we knew it uh, from Eastman and... I went to Yale with Yuki and uh, me. Um, he did a paper on it, and apparently in the beginning, Stravinsky chose that register because it was supposed to sound strained and, you know, like birth coming into the world or something like that. Um, but now the standards are that it has to sound really beautiful. So that's a little frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Just like make a statement and make it sound really awkward and bad. It's an artistic yeah. choice. <laughs> Okay, well, so that means you're all tied at three now. Three points each, okay? I'll update that right here on our scoreboard. And we're going to move on to round two. Things start to get real here, okay? Each correct answer gets you two points, all right? And here is your question. Question four for two points. What is the Renaissance precursor to the bassoon? A, the sackbut. B, the recorder. C, the shawm. D, the dulcian. Okay, let's get your answers ready. And if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you can also play. Okay. One more time. Um, it, it, uh, so here out. are your, your uh, options again. For the Renaissance precursor to the bassoon. A, Sackbut, B, the recorder, C, the shawm, S-H-A-W-M, D, the dulcian. Okay, answers ready? One, two, three, go. And we have three Ds and we have two points each. Woo! We remain tied. Okay, somebody <laughs> eventually is probably going to get one wrong, right? Or I guess we'll have three winners at the end. So so that gets you all to five <laughs> points. <laughs> okay. Our teachers will be so proud. I know, I know. You're making many people proud right now. You you have to understand, out of in four people we have nine degrees in bassoon. Like we need to we need to get this right. <laughs> like <laughs> <Tarantara>. <laughs> 
very good. Um, let me share with you about the Dulcian uh, that uses of the Dulcian would have included playing dance music with the shams and sakbuts of the city watch, chamber music, and the grand polychoral repertoire from Venice and Germany, such as Giovanni Gabrielli and Heinrich Schütz. Okay, so you all got it right. It's D. Dulcian is the Renaissance precursor to the bassoon. All right, so tied at five points, we go for question five. And your question is, how many bassoon concertos did Vivaldi write? A, three. B, zero. C, 39. D, 15. How many bassoon concertos did Vivaldi write? Okay, you guys ready? Yuki's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so A is 3 B is 0 C is 39 D is 15 Are you guys ready? Alright, 1, 2, 3, go <gasps> Wow You are all Correct 39 bassoon concertos And none of these By the way, were published In Vivaldi's lifetime so I think it all comes down to round three, where one correct answer will get you five points. Let's update the score first. You're all tied at seven. <laughs> okay. My favorite thing about the Vivaldi concertos, I just feel like sharing with the world, is that they were all premiered by women, mm. which is pretty remarkable for any concerto, for any instrument. I think they were written for his students at the the girls' orphanage, right? I was yeah. about Hospital de la Pieta. I was I was about to ask if maybe that's why. That's very yeah. cool. Yeah, and many of his string pieces also were written mm. for those students. Very cool. So yes, thirty nine. That's a lot of them. Um, and we're ready for our uh, third and final round. Actually, I said it's five points. This gets you five points. So let me. Wait. Yes. It gets you five points. Sorry, I, I am realizing that there's something on the screen here that is incorrect, but I just fixed it. Okay. Give us all our points. You're all Come tied at seven. Okay, so here it is, your final question. The suspense. I know, right? Wait, what's happening? having a bit of a malfunction here with my uh, interface. Oh, this is really weird. I'm like clicking and it's not uh, showing, all right? I think I can fix this by... See, and th this is what happens when you're live. Some things, sometimes things happen. Let's see if I just drag it again. There it is. Very good. Okay, you guys ready? Your final question for five points. What is the species name? What, what is the species name of the cane used to make bassoon reeds? What is the name of the species of, uh, of the cane used to make bassoon reeds? A. Arundo donax. B. Grandus oboes. C. Saccharum officinarum, D. Theronimus cinderianus. I'm gonna give those to you again, okay? <laughs> A. Arundo donax, B. Grandus oboes, C. Saccharum officinarum, D. Theronimus cinderianus. Okay? So get your answers ready. I'll give you a countdown from five, four, three, two, one, go. <gasps> you guys, <laughs> you're all winners. Whee! It's a three-way tie. I am actually very impressed. 
you guys that one were... was stressful. That, one was one. <laughs> that last one. You're masters of, of bassoon trivia. Good okay. job, guys. So all of your winners. Good game. <laughs> uh, and uh, so Chris came up with these uh, names. And yes, A is correct. So did, did you actually know that or was this process of elimination? There is a remaking uh, actual like business that uses part of that word. I can't remember if it was the first or the second, and that's how I kind of read. Like, oh, I've heard that. Yeah, it sounded a little familiar, and the yeah. rest. Well, the Ogo one sounded made yeah. up, but I didn't know the other one. <laughs> and the third one sounded like sacred something. So. Mm -hmm. So the uh, <laughs> the uh, second one, Grandus Oboes, means big oboe. The third one, Saccharum officinarum, is sugarcane. Oh. And the uh, and D, Thyronimus swindarianus, swindarianus means greater cane rat. So, <laughs> you all won. You're winners. Okay. Congrats, guys. Congrats to all of you. Okay, now, um, let's move on after this... Uh, very rewarding victory to a <laughs> segment that we call what are you into okay so i want to ask each of you starting with yuki because now you're on top of my screen here when you're not playing bassoon or uh, working your day job what are you into what do you spend your free time doing well right now it's uh definitely playing animal crossing on the switch <laughs> Um, uh, let's see what else I have. It's summertime. So I have been experimenting with, um, making homemade popsicles and ice cream. Oh. Um, this weekend I'm planning to figure out how to make mint chocolate chip popsicles. Um, so. <laughs> Do you use like a Vitamix or like, like, like some kind of blender or. Um, I just use a food processor. That's all I have. Oh, you do. Um, yeah. But you can use like a hand mixer or a blender and just kind of puree your fruits and whatnot. Or you can use like a, yeah, like the regular hand mixer whisk, whisk thing. So. What, what's been your most successful uh, popsicle to date? Um, the hardest one was creating a strawberry shortcake uh, popsicle because it takes like two days. Um, you make the strawberry ice cream and freeze that and then i made a shortbread cookie crumble from scratch instead of buying like vanilla wafer crackers um and then went searching for um uh, like freeze dried strawberries which is actually really hard to find in my neighborhood um and then when that the ice cream was frozen the next day then you have to you know uh, cover cover it with the strawberry shortcake uh, coding yeah was so. it worth the effort it was yeah it was pretty easy <laughs> so if you had to enter a popsicle into a competition this would be it so far you think <laughs> good okay uh, lauren what, what are you into what do you do with your non-bassoon time well i really love traveling and obviously i can't do that right now um kara and i were supposed to be in europe last month doing an archaeological dig, archaeological dig at um, Vindolanda, um, which is a fort that I had been to before. So I really love traveling specifically to um, alt ruins. So like Machu Picchu, Pompeii, that kind of stuff. Um, and aside from that, I, for activities, uh, my husband and I really like to go rock climbing. So um, we like, and biking, although more leisurely than Brittany does it really intensely she'll do century rides where she does 100 miles so we don't do that Whoa. um but yeah and then finally i like to do crafts so um like using especially with paper um i really like to do things like making a i think for our last group trip i made a a little like accordion um journal thing for us to uh keep track of all of our stops so i like doing stuff like that oh, that's cool but, but but the archaeological dig, how do you, like, are these, like, things that you can just sign up and do, or, or how, how what, what's... Yeah, so at Eastman, there's a program that's called Take 5, and if you get accepted, you get to do a year in any study you 
you want that's out of your degree. So I did archaeology. And um, most places that if you sign up to do archaeology, it's either that it's expensive or um, it's not well, uh, like the safety regulations aren't great. Oh. So this one, Vindolanda, is really special where anybody can volunteer. And the only thing is they, they uh, run out of spots almost instantly. So Kara and I stayed up actually Yuki was with us until 4 a.m. To, to get a spot this this last time. I mean, just snabbed the spots, but then we didn't get to go, so. Do you think you'll get to do that eventually? Like, do you get to reclaim your spot and, you know, a, a free, a pandemic-free future? Yeah, we have our spots reserved for next year. They carried it over, but okay, we'll good. see what happens. Ooh, so, yes. hopefully. Wow, very cool. Okay, Kara, how about you? Hmm, I think, like, for daily pleasures, I like crossword puzzles, going for walks, and reading books. Those are kind of my simple pleasures. Uh, but I just finished taking a course from the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in drawing. So I've been doing a lot of drawing, not just with graphite pencils, which I've gotten better at, but using ink and charcoal, willow charcoal, uh, Conte crayons, and learning all these different mediums. And that's been super fun. Very cool. Very cool. Let me uh, ask you guys now as we uh, get close to uh, the end of our time together. There is uh, a segment we do uh, called Sound Advice uh, on the MYS Virtual Hangouts. And I would like to invite each of you to share some sound advice with the Metropolitan Youth Symphony students. And my, my question to each of you is, if you could go back in time and find yourself in high school or or like maybe early high school uh practicing bassoon somewhere or like out with your friends or whatever what advice would you have for yourself your high school self so uh, who wants to start <laughs> nose goes i can start um it sounds corny but really for me, it would just be just do it. Because for my thinking behind that is like, if there's any hobbies or interests or uh, anything that you're, you just have a passion for, you know, a lot of times people might be afraid to take that step to even say that they want to do it or, um, you know, don't know where or who to go to, like what resources, um, to find, to kind of pursue that interest. Um, and if you're like, if you're, if the first idea is to be like, I'm just gonna do it, then, you know, you will probably start talking to other people about it. And then someone might know, oh yeah, I have a cousin or I know a teacher who is involved in that. Let me connect uh, you to that person. And you'll just find kind of like a, a community of people that you'll, that likes you know, the same interests, and I think that'll just make you a happier person. Um, and in adulthood and during college as well, like if there's a course that you like that might not be um, related to your degree, but you're interested in it, um, just go for it. Because, you know, it's a lot of times, even though it might not be related, it's gonna, affect you and probably benefit you um, later on in the future, just kind of unknowingly. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't think that's corny at all. I think that's excellent advice. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah. Who's next? I can go, I guess. So um, I know I was trying to think about this. Something that I've thought about recently, though, um, that maybe builds on what Yuki's saying is that um, when I was younger, I thought that there were like, when you're younger, there are like concrete steps that you're going through. You're moving from grade to grade, and then you have these little benchmarks that you hit in time. Um, and now as I get away from school, I see how that slightly changes my like identity and my relationship to what I do and my musicianship. And I just wish that um, I had um, that I understood when I was younger that like even when I was 17 like I was a musician 
like if you are a musician or if you feel like you are whatever this this is that you know yourself to be like you can go ahead and claim that right now and start acting like it um you don't have to like pass off your scales on november 1st to move on to then like being awesome at like listening to a concerto or being able to like understand a great interpretation of xyz piece i kind of wish that i had just kind of like um done it all and embodied my identity as a musician younger um i don't mean to speak so generally but but that's the idea is that like i, I kind of wish i had just been like yeah i can do this and i do do this and here i am and i have these great friends and i have these great resources um just a couple other quick ones um the, some of the most valuable directions that I've gone on in life have come at the advice of really trusted um, people who had more experience than me. So speaking to people who have more experience than you and, and learning from their experiences can be valuable um, if there's a way for you to gain a lesson from that. And then the other one is that the things that made my career so far special have all been the things that I've kind of had to learn on the go. So projects that like, for instance, The Breaking Winds was an extracurricular project. Things that we started and things that we had to kind of stumble through taught us the most. So if you're interested in something um, that came out of your own brain, take it and run, and I bet you'll learn the most lessons that way. So go for it. That's uh, you, you <laughs> Like said. Yuki said. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Lauren? <laughs> just bring on something so I don't forget. Uh, my advice would be, my first advice would be to have an open mind of what defines success. So this is actually picking, piggybacking off of both Yuki and Kara. But I think when I first went in to the conservatory, I was thinking that you were successful if you got a, a job as a principal basuna somewhere, or you know just a job in an orchestra. Um, and that's still really wonderful. Like I'm, I'm really happy for my conservatory friends that have gone on to do that. But I, I think the truth is that the music world is really evolving right now. And you can still make a living playing music. You can make a living doing something else and playing music. You're just as valid of a musician if you do that. Um, but it's really hard to get that in your head. And I think, I wish I had been okay with that earlier on because I think then I would have realized um, that I could have pivoted in another direction and, and still been a musician at the same time without having that this like guilty feeling. Um, whatever you do, commit and and do it well. So, you know, like the whatever you do, do be a good one or something. Um, I, I think sometimes, as Kara mentioned, if you don't feel like you have a direction, it can be kind of, that's uh, what I'm looking for. It can be, it can just, you know, you, you can stop there and, um, be afraid to take a step forward. So you're like, I don't know which direction I want to go to. There's 50. Um, but I have never regretted anything that I really worked hard at. So even if you work really hard in an audition and you you don't advance, it's you've gained so much knowledge and insight. And if you try a new skill like coding and it's not for you, it, it, I've never regretted anything that I've really tried. Yeah. So I would just say, don't, don't give 50% effort, just give 100% effort in whatever direction and it'll eventually lead to something great. Um, and finally, I would say don't do something that you hate. <laughs> mm. So if you're doing something because people have told you you should do it or this is the expected path, but you realize along the way that there's something about it that it stresses you out and you're just having an unhappy life, there are so many opportunities and places that would value you that you should search for those. Yes. Well, thank you for that. Thank you to all three of you for, for sharing that. Before we let you go, our final little segment is the plug. So is there anything Breaking Winds related or otherwise that you guys would like to uh, invite our viewers to check out or, or to uh, pay attention to? And I, I see that uh, 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 we have a cameo here by a special friend. This is the guy that did this. Yes. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, check out Lauren's cat, T. Um, you can follow us on all our socials. All our handle is the breaking winds on everything. If you want to see the work that we've done over the last 10 years, 
um, things are slow right now as we're dealing with the COVID crisis and scattered all over the country. But um, you should be following us in order to get the news of our upcoming album, which we've um, just finished selecting cuts for. Nice, <laughs> very cool. Um, so there's still going to be editing, mixing, and mastering to go. Um, hopefully that'll come out by the end of the year. It's called A Broken Anthology of Western Music, and it's fun, funny, and sometimes serious takes on great music from classical music history. The special twist that we're trying to put on this project is to also release some sheet music with this. So there'll be a recording and accompanying sheet music for all you bassoonists out there. Um, and now that we've announced it, we're definitely going to get it done. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but it's, it just feels like a really cool project and it's music that belongs to all of us. Um, it's really fun to hear it through the bassoon lens. Yes. Very cool. Well, I am looking forward to it. I'm very excited about it. Because, I mean, uh, you guys do so many things, and, and you guys are so creative and, and inspiring. But the main reason why you're successful is that you sound great. You know, you guys just are amazing musicians, and what you're, what you're creating is really spectacular quality and artistry. And on top of that, you know, you have all the other fun and amazing things. So... Um, I want to thank all three of you for taking the time to hang out with, with us at the Metropolitan Youth Symphony here in Portland. And uh, we're going to go follow your social media channels. We'll be paying attention and waiting for that album. And um, uh, I'm going to let you guys go. And uh, viewers, I'm going to play a third short video by The Breaking Winds. It's an arrangement of a piece by Claude Debussy, Cakewalk, which is originally for piano solo mm -hmm. and this was arranged by one of oh, you. Oh, I did I did it on a on a plane ride while we were on tour. Oh, you did. Very yeah. cool. It's a Fun short fact. and sweet and it kind of shows, you know, you, your work with Breaking Winds when it comes to arranging and adapting music that was not originally for bassoon quartet into bassoon quartet. So, uh, I'll start playing that We'll let you guys go. And then after the video, I will let you guys know about our upcoming guests uh, next week and beyond. So here's Debussy's Cakewalk by The Breaking Winds. And thank you again to The Breaking Winds <laughs> and T for joining us. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Debussy's Cakewalk, arranged for Bassoon Quartet by Cara Lamour from The Breaking Winds. Just casually make an arrangement for, for Bassoon Quartet while you're sitting on a plane, because why not? And they sound great. So thank you again to The Breaking Winds. You guys go check out their social media channels. Follow them on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and all of that. So you can be uh, the first to know when they release their next album. And 
Thursday this week, we have a special morning edition of The Hangout at 11 a.m. Colin Curry, the world-renowned percussionist, is going to be joining us all the way from the UK. And uh, we're going to have a couple of surprise appearances by surprise to Colin, anyways, unless he watches this, uh, by uh, percussionists from the Oregon Symphony. Then next week, what a lineup, you guys. Uh, Tuesday, July 14th, Regina Carter and Alvester Garnett are going to be both joining us. Of course, Regina Carter was most recently seen here in Portland as a guest soloist with the Metropolitan Youth Symphony, performing with us David Schiff's Concerto for Jazz Violin for Sisters. And then on Thursday of next week, July 16th, Adam Lufman, he's a trumpet faculty of the San Francisco Conservatory, and he's the principal trumpet player for the San Francisco Opera and the San Francisco Ballet, and he's just an extraordinary musician and teacher. So join us again Thursday, Colin Curry. You guys, I will see you then. And by the way, we're going to play another round of trivia about the city of Portland with Colin Curry and friends. So thank you again. I will see you Thursday. Thank mm -hmm. you.